Yes, I see lots of happy people. How amazing. Welcome to uh, today's party. I'm sorry, I mean town hall. We will be uh, talking about very important issues today. Uh, so go ahead and get settled in. You know, if you need a cup of coffee or a, whatever it is, a breakfast smoothie, um, whatever it is that uh, around the 10 o'clock in your day is, uh, you know, brings you to life, uh, go ahead and settle in. I'm uh, Darren Zook. I'm kind of the, um, I guess, the MC for today. Uh, I'll have a few things to say in the course of our panel, but for those of you who are new to the town hall format, uh, the way it works is this. We're going to kind of go through the panelists one at a time, and they're all going to give short presentations uh, kind of based upon their own fields of expertise about today's topic. That should take us to about the halfway point. It's an hour and a half that we have here, so it should take us to around 45, 50 minutes. Uh, and after that, we will then turn our attention to all of you uh, in terms of your questions or insights and comments you'd like us to address. And the easiest way to do that on Zoom, uh, being the, uh, the fun-filled thing that Zoom is, is to find the chat function, uh, which is pretty easy to find. It should be on your bottom bar and it says chat. You just click on it, opens up. And feel free, as we're talking, to... Um, just throw in a question. And what I'll do after we finish our presentations is I'll go to those questions and I'll kind of read through them and I will parse them out to the panelists unless of course you want to address it specifically to a panelist. Um, so very quickly, aside from you know, saying how happy I am to see you, um, why, a pa you know, why a town hall, for instance, on the idea of who owns the truth? Well, the idea of this you know, came, from, came out of this idea of of hearing over and over again, and I think more and more frequently from so many people, you know, the, this the sense of almost exasperation of things like, you know, I wish I could get consistent information, or I wish I knew who I could believe. You know, I hear this on Tuesday, I hear this on Wednesday, and you know, it, it's more than just inconsistent information. There's this real sense of of kind of a an eroding trust, or or perhaps an eroding ability to make sense of the onslaught of inconsistent information. So the question becomes, is this, uh, you know, where is this coming from? Is it really just kind of incessant spin out of control or is something else going on there? And each of our panelists will have different insights uh, as to, you know, that part of the question. And like I said, I'm just gonna go from, from panelist to panelist uh, in a particular order. And I'm gonna turn it over to our first panelist here uh, pretty much, well, right now. So. Let me introduce all of you to um, our first panelist of the day, who happens to be Sandra Bass. And uh, Sandra, if you're there, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, jump right in. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm totally intimidated by this topic because I think about how difficult and complicated this, you know, truth is at any time, and particularly in our current moment. Um, and there's so much complexity and nuance in the idea of what truth is and who defines it or who owns it. Um, and I also think that as challenging as that is, that we can often know or have a sense of when we're being lied to and falsehoods. And we're also living in a moment where there's a lot of intentionality around manipulation of information um, and even you know, blatant lying in some ways. And, and I find myself engaging in daily acts of discernment in different ways than I think I did in the past. Uh, so I'm really glad that I have such amazing colleagues because they can all talk about that <laughs> in different ways than I would. You know, as I started thinking about what I wanted to share today, I, I, I started thinking about how I think about truth. And I, I tend to be a relational thinker. Um, and part of that is because it's central to the work I've done my entire life um, around, you know, how do we think about building relationships across you know, either political divides or, you know, building coalitions, things like that. And so I'd like to offer some thoughts from that perspective. Um, and when I think about the relationship I have to the idea of truth, I think about all the different types of truth that have given meaning and texture to my own personal and professional life. So, you know, that could be from the truth that I've discovered through my own lived experiences, um, to my relationship to factual truths or historical truths or scientific truths. Um, you know, the frequent realization that I come to that there are often competing truths and how can I hold those tensions? 
Uh, and up to and including these sort of grandest notions of big T truth, as I call it, which could be either cosmological or transcendental in some point. So for me, I approach that question from that lens, like, you know, how, how, is, how am I thinking about truth as being both relational and contextual? Um, and one particular context I'm thinking about today is the relationship that we've had with truth as it relates to our public health crisis. Um, so over these last 18 months, it's been really disheartening to me to see how the pandemic and public health information has been so politicized. You know, whether we should vaccinate or not, or wear a mask or not, um, and how that plays out in certain communities. Um, and even as I find that maddening and disheartening, um, it also has raised some questions for me as to why that is happening. Um, and of course, there are lots of reasons why. Some of it is embedded in ideology, some of it is a sense of entitlement, some is it of assessing risk and how different people do that. And there's also a fair amount of manipulation and misinformation happening. Um, but I wanted to speak to one particular factor um, that I'm seeing expressed around the veracity of the information because I've actually had to hold this question for myself. Um, and that is whether the science could be trusted. Um, and even some people you know, suggesting there might be a conspiracy of some afoot. So I don't share those concerns, but it did, um, I did start thinking about like, why would people believe that? And it led me to start thinking about my own relationship to some scientific truths. So let me give you one example from my own personal life. And this is about the long history of the politicization of birth certificates. Um, and this was not invented with birtherism, uh, with Obama. Uh, birth, birth certificates have been you know, political documents and social control documents for a long time. Um, and you know, recently I was looking at my own birth certificate a few years ago. And I'll just, well, I'll start with my family. So my father was born in, in Alabama in the 1930s. Um, he is in rural Alabama, midwife. Um, he had no birth certificate as he discovered in his 30s. He didn't find out until his 30s because he tried to get a passport and then found out he didn't have a birth certificate. And my grandmother was alive at the time. And so she had to sign some kind of legal documentation to certify that she actually gave birth to him. Um, and what I thought is that for that moment, up until you know, his 30s, he was actually undocumented. And he had no way of proving that he had birthright citizenship in this country, which as a black man in Alabama is pretty perilous. Um, and then I thought about my mother who was born in the 1930s in Mississippi and on her birth certificate, her race is listed as Negro. And that was all that was needed you know, to designate what they thought they would define for her life, where she would live, where she could go or couldn't go, what kind of work she could do, who she could marry, whether or not she could be, you know, an active participant in civic life. So then I come to my birth certificate. So I was born in the 1960s in San Jose. And on my birth certificate, my race is listed as Negroid. Not Negro, not colored, not black, Negroid. Um, and as some of you may know, there is a, a relatively short and ignoble history to the term Negroid. <laughs> um, and it started around the 1780s and it's tied to scientific racism, which emerged as one way of providing a scientific rationalization and justification for colonization and slavery. And so the system divided people into three categories, uh, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and the least evolved, lowest racial category of Negroid. So I've known this for a few years and I really didn't think much about it. And then a few years ago, I really decided to go down that rabbit hole a bit. Like why would this happen in California of all places and San Jose in the sixties? Um, and what I found was that, you know, this racial classification system was central to the emergence of eugenics um, that had started in the late, eight, excuse me, late 19th century for the most part and really took off in the 20th century. Um, and it was not a marginal movement. There were major respected leaders like Margaret Sanger, who founded the Plan, uh, Planned Parenthood, um, and the legendary African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois sort of flirted with eugenics at times. And in California, there were hugely prominent people who were leaders in this movement, and many of them were in higher education. So the founding president of Stanford University was the chairman of a, a few eugenics commissions and societies. Um, the chairman of the board for California State University in Sacramento founded a eugenic society. 
The man who created the IQ test was a member of a eugenics group, also based in California. Um, and so one of the primary tools that they were putting forward as part of eugenics, uh, their aims was forced sterilizations. And California was a leader here too. So by 1921, California accounted for 80% of sterilizations nationwide. And African-Americans were sterilized at four times their rate in the population. Um, and the formal program continued up until the 1970s. Um, and African-American women who were at particular risk for sterilization were those who hadn't graduated from high school. And, you know, it just made me think, you know, that because of that designation, I, you know, had my life taken another route, you know, I could have been at risk of this. Um, the eugenics movement also, you know, was very well established in the U.S. and California eugenicists, in particular, produced a lot of liter literature that, you know, informed and inspired what happened in Germany under the Nazis. Um, and one study found that by 1933, California had subjected more people to forced sterilizations than any other U.S. state, or than all other U.S. states combined. Excuse me. And, and even beyond this formal program ending in the late 70s, into the 2010s, there were incidents of women in prison being involuntarily sterilized to the point where California had to pass a bill in 2014 that bans sterilization in correctional facilities unless it was required to, to save an inmate's life. So I share all of that because, you know, in the moment that this was happening, this was that scientific truth. And yet what we know to be true today is that race is a social contract, that none of this was actually true. Yet because of those classifications, because of my relationship to the truth of that birth certificate, it really shows the danger sometimes when we're aligning truth with power and political and social goals. Um, so this is one example, and there are many, and particularly if you're a member of a marginalized group and, and you know, it plays out in many different spheres of social life. Um, so I come back to this question of where we are uh, and to try to step into the experience of some of those people who are questioning the veracity of our public health moment. And while I don't agree or necessarily feel, you know, that this particular moment that I, I'm not questioning the scientific truth I would sell. Uh, I also don't feel compelled to demonize these people. Rather, I try to understand, and, and I'm trying to think about what, what might we need at this, to make that shift happen. Um, and so just for myself, you may be asking yourself, I wonder if she got vaccinated? And the answer is yes. Um, that was not a question for me. Um, and how I came to that decision was a combination of factors. So some of it was rationality and reason, you know, looking at risks and you know, what is the likelihood of nefarious intent here? Uh, I tried to do like my sort of anecdotal research, but you know, this is my rational mind working. Um, I'm also old enough to remember, you know, I lived through measles. I lived through mumps. My brother almost died from chickenpox. So, you know, I didn't have this, this relationship of, of distrust towards vaccination. So that kind of triggered for me as well. But when I really think about what led to me making that decision, if I'm honest, it comes back to my grounding of what I call my big T truths. Um, and that is around my sense of responsibility to my family and my community uh, and my understanding um, and aspirations for our interdependence and interconnectedness. So I thought about like, what would it mean, you know, how does that my vaccination impact my community making its way through this pandemic? I spent a lot of time about two, I spent a lot of time around two lively octogenarians, my parents, and I wanted them to be safe. Um, and I also wanted to, play my part to ensure the safety of people I'd never met. Um, and so those were, I actually think those are more compelling to me than some of the more rational reasons. Um, and so one of the questions that Darren asked me to consider was like, does our pandemic um, reflect a crisis of truth? Um, and, you know, if reflecting on my own relationship to scientific truth, I think, yes, some of that may be true, but I also would say that for some of us, our survival has been dependent upon our willingness to challenge the so-called truths of the day. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure, maybe it's a bit of a crisis of truth, <laughs> but what I, I'm actually wondering is what we have is a crisis of trust. 
And if that's true, the question we may wanna consider is what type of a relationships do we need to foster and facilitate with our institutions, our government, um, and even each other to forge the type of trust that will allow us to reweave a viable, equitable, and just, just social world. So there's just some, some of my top line thoughts. And again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Sandra. Thanks for your insights and your comments. Uh, like just to remind everybody out there that if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I'll get back to them after all of the presenters have presented their insights and thoughts. So we now turn our attention to our next panelist who happens to be Deirdre English. So Deirdre, if you're there, please unmute yourself and uh, I will turn the virtual floor over to you. All right, well, thank you. And I hope I can be here, heard well and please let me know, Darren, if, if you feel that I'm not. So I really, really appreciated Sandra's remarks and I liked where she landed on saying, do we really have a crisis of truth? or a crisis of trust. That could be a topic for a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a crisis of trust and a lot of it has to do with the fact that so many people don't see themselves reflected in journalism. Um, I'm gonna be talking about journalism and, and, um, and truth. And uh, so, you know, unless, unless people feel that they know journalists, that they see people who are journalists who look like them, who reflect their values, who seem to understand their community, uh, unless they feel that trust, they will feel alienated from the get-go and they're not necessarily going to believe what they're told. And so, you know, I, I really think that uh, I, might, I might come full circle to what, where Sandra ended to, to say that that is a, a crucial problem. I'll just say a little bit about my, myself and my relationship to journalism and um, truth. So I definitely came of age in the 70s as an anti-war protester. Um, and on my, my birthday, 1970, we were uh, already protesting the war in Vietnam when Kent State happened on May 4th, 1970 of that year. And it was a galv galvanizing for the student anti-war movement. And then on May 15th came the killings at Jackson State. And so, there was a, a strong sense of a youth movement that stood in opposition to the war in Vietnam and felt betrayed by all of our leaders or you know, most of our leaders, um, a government that kept going in the war in Vietnam long after it seemed um, futile and, and, and deadly and even genocidal and, um, and newspapers that too often acted as, the, uh, as stenographers of government and didn't bring us the, the alternative perspectives that were available. Um, we could talk more about why they were available, but people were, there was able to, it was possible kind of war reporting at that time than has been true in the last 20 years of wars. Freelancers could go to Vietnam and figure out what was going on and they did. So uh, I got engaged in that kind of anti-war journalism and then, uh, and then along came the women's movement and I became very involved in the women's movement. And I worked, uh, I wrote a book with Barbara Ehrenreich that was basically about deconstructing gender and criticizing what um, uh, had been told to women by doctors, medical professionals and psychiatric professionals, gerontologists, pediatricians, the whole medical profession had been, been conveying expert opinion to women that was very damaging and wrong in many instances. And so I spent some time working on basically exposés of medical misinformation about women. And uh, then I wound up um, as the editor of Mother Jones Magazine. So Mother Jones Magazine was very much um, created to be, to push back against mainstream media, to do investigative reporting, to find things that were not being um, told to deconstruct the lies of government uh, and of corporations. Um, so, you know, I came very much from outside of the center as a critic of the center. Now I teach at the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley, and I certainly bring those same values with me. 
Um, our students, and it's Berkeley, so you know the kinds of students that we attract are are critical. Um, they 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 do approach the media with skepticism, which is good. And certainly we're trying to train our students, whether they go into the mainstream media or whether they go into alternative media or these days, you know, there's, there's so many other alternatives and things that they do. Um, so, but we certainly hope that we're training them to be skeptical and critical thinkers and to not allow themselves to be used by power structures to convey, you know, um, misinformation to vulnerable populations. But even as that's our intent, I've, we've also been going through the last 20 years where the media has been collapsing. So I, I should say the journalistic media has been collapsing. And um, I've perhaps been guilty myself in talking of doing something that I think is a really big mistake to do, which is conflating journalism with the media. There's a big difference between journalism properly understood and the media. And, um, and I, I'm sorry to say that I just made that mistake myself, but uh, journalism properly understood is, you know, fact checked with a with legitimate journalism has a, a, a commitment to skepticism and to truth seeking. I would never say truth telling because we never know what the truth is. We can only seek to know what the truth is but truth seeking, you know, so, and we can talk about how we teach our students to do that. But at the same time that that kind of more legitimate approach to journalism is still ex extant, journalism has been declining because of the basic problems of its business model and is being swamped by social media basically and by what I would consider illegitimate forms of media, namely Fox News. Um, and, and others that don't exist in order to be skeptical, don't exist in order to seek the truth, but actually are aberrant forms that um, are, exist for completely different, uh, with completely different motivations. So, you know, uh, the number of what would be considered legitimate journalism sources has declined by over a fourth. Journalism jobs are in peril. Now, people talk about coal miner jobs or industrial jobs being in peril, but actually decent journalism jobs are very much in peril. It's not a well-paying profession. It's a profession in which our graduates, you know, they graduate and then they go into a kind of a churn, you know, where they employed by one place for a while and then maybe it goes bankrupt or it lays people off uh, and they go to another place. It's a very unstable, poorly paid um, profession in which students and which our graduates also now have to confront an enormous amount of trolling um, and, um, and, and face the fact that they've now entered a profession that's actually despised by the majority of Americans. Trust, to go back to Sandra's point about trust, trust in journalism in this country is at a very, very low ebb and uh, compared to, other, to other, uh, many other countries as well. I mean, it's lower than most other countries. So it's very discouraging. And um, I do think it is a crisis. Uh, I, there, there is a crisis of truth seeking, um, legitimate truth seeking by well-intentioned um, people who are well-trained in legitimate journalism. And um, it's, I do think there has been a crisis around COVID. Um, many, many people have gotten their information from Fox or from social media, um, misinformation and disinformation. So to end on a somewhat positive note, uh, after all that gloom, um, I would say that we're aware of this at the Graduate School of Journalism and we're certainly fighting back and we have um, investigative reporting projects on misinformation and disinformation. We are training students in open source um, investigations. We are, we are really putting a big um, emphasis on figuring out on doing the reporting, the fundamental investigative reporting to figure out case after case where uh, misinformation and disinformation is coming from in order to make the public more aware of its sources. And it's not, it really isn't a mystery. I mean, some comes from various state actors, including Russia uh, and others. 
but many come from um, individuals and um, profit seeking groups within our own country. Misinformation and disinformation is profitable. And so um, we are following the money and we are trying to get to the bottom of who is propagating um, the larger streams of misinformation and disinformation and exposing it. That's what journalists do at their best. And that is what the Graduate School of Journalism is involved in, in, in doing. Um, and I hope it will have a good effect. So thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. I, I think it will have a great effect. Um, I'm going to move on to our next panelist, uh, who happens to be me, because um, you know the, the title of the panel is "Who Owns Truth?" and the answer is simple: I do. Um, okay, not really. By the way, uh, I, I have been remiss in my duties. I want to thank Nancy for this. Uh, I've been introducing all the panelists just as the people that I know. Uh, I forgot to go into the the bio and the information, so Nancy has posted this in the chat, so you can uh, you can see the. The, 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 in more detail, who's on our panel if you know, want to know information that's right, right there in the chat. I'm just gonna sp speak briefly because you know, I've already had some air time in terms of introducing the event. And so here's what I did uh, earlier this week. Um, you know, when I was trying to think of something I would talk about and share with all of you, I was thinking of something that would, you know, that, that wouldn't court controversy. So I didn't want to alienate anybody. And I, and I found the perfect topic, which of course is abortion. So. Um, what I did was this, uh, you know, I, I, I'm teaching a class on human rights right now, and I, I asked my students, I said, you know, how do you feel about the Supreme Court decision about Texas, the, the, the abortion law in Texas? And of course, there was just, you know, they're Berkeley students. I mean, just the, the, the whole room kind of lit up with, with anger and, and claims and counterclaims. But then I said this, I said, how many of you have actually read the Supreme Court opinion itself? And the answer was zero. None, no one had actually thought to go to the original document to see what was actually said, which meant they lived in a world of thriving on what other people said about what was said. So I actually brought the, 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 the Supreme Court's decision in, both, both the majority opinion, it was a 5-4 decision, the majority opinion, and all three dissenting opinions, and I went through them. I took an entire class period and went through it. And students were quite frankly shocked. And actually at the end, they were, they were actually far more hopeful than they were before they read it. Because even the majority opinion, which was you know, characterized as this evil conservative cabal of people who were trying to overturn Roe v. Wade, it makes it pretty clear that it probably is not that kind of a threat because all they said was, we can't address the constitutionality of the issue because the, the people who presented the case decided not to choose constitutionality as the thing to focus on. And the court said, basically, we can't answer a question that isn't asked of us. And of course, Justice Sotomayor, being the lovely person that she is, was like, we can answer any question we want to. But that was part of her dissent. So my point here is that, you know, it's, it's not that hard to get as close to the information as you want to get. If you'd like to read the Supreme Court opinion and you can't find it, write me an email, I'll send you my PDF. So rather than rely upon you know, what other people have said about something, one of the best ways to kind of rebuild your trust in, in the sources of media you rely upon or the reports you're hearing is to, is to seek out that information, find the original report, uh, find the original press release, go to the institution's website, uh, it's extraordinarily empowering to find the information on your own and kind of, you know, you know, journalism is there to read, personal experience is there to rely upon, but also going you know, straight to the heart of the truth is, is, is a great way to kind of see through the spin that exists all around us. And that's all I'm going to say for now in terms of just sharing with you an exercise I engaged in this week. So that's my, my interlude for today. I'm going to move on to our next panelist who happens to be Carlos Torres. And Carlos, if you are there, please unmute yourself and uh, I will yield the Zoom screen to you. All right, well, I like the perspectives being offered so far. Deidre, I was just watching CNN because I'm a news junkie and uh, they had a, a panel that was multi-ethnic. I was really surprised, a discussion panel. I think they're listening. 
And I've noticed lately too that CNN World is offering solutions, <laughs> not just problems. Um, so th I think uh, mainstream media is uh, is undergoing, or I hope is undergoing, uh, a crisis of consciousness and representation. So what I do, though, I'm a media anthropologist. I look at the representation of people worldwide and how they self-represent and how mainstream media depicts people. And I've kind of been tasked with finding out what the anthropology of truth could look like or where it could begin. And what I would say is if we look at, you know, tribal and band culture, small scale uh, culture from the past and still tribal culture from today, um, there are two kinds of truth, basically. There's one perspectival truth, one person's truth, but there's also the consensus of that community, right? Um, and uh, when ethnographers went to visit the Kung San people in, uh, in Africa about 50 years ago, looking for how tribal people communicated, the first thing they noticed was, wow, you know, they don't spend all day gathering food. You know, they do that in pretty short order. What they do all day is argue. <laughs> and they don't really argue, it turns out. What they're really trying to do is find consensus truth and hear all sides of the story and hammer it out. And they chat all day long to find out. So the truth is really important to a band society. It could really, uh, really uh, you know, equate to your survival as a people or not. Secondhand news uh, in this case is not that important. And nevertheless, like Darren would say, it's uh, you can always get a firsthand source. On the other hand, where does the anthropology then of lying start? And I was thinking of where's the real invention of lying? There was a movie that came out called The Invention of Lying in 2009 that was really funny. But I think the invention of lying really starts with the invention of hypocrisy and deception. And I think when you see deception uh, evolving is when large scale societies form around uh, 7,000 years ago during what we call the agricultural revolution. And when there becomes a dependence on monocrops and agriculture and um, larger scale societies begin to emerge, we've noticed in the, in the gene, uh, in, the, in the records of, of our genotypes that uh, that from 5,000 to 3,000 years ago in the Mesopotamian, there was large scale warfare. And this coincides with agriculture. And what I would argue that for, for people to, to organize warfare, you do have to convince others, right, of enemies. And so you do have to propagate some sort of propaganda to them in order to do that. Uh, it became a real problem, and we see a massive uh, death from 5,000 to 3,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. By the time you get to Hammurabi's laws in 1500, right? Hammurabi really wants to tap down that violence. Once again, the society is larger, but Hammurabi's laws are not just about an eye for an eye. They're really about the rights of women, marital disputes, and curbing the abuses of the moneyed class and powerful who are usurping their rights. Now, all societies have a sort of inner truth that comes from their laws and religion and philosophies and creation myths, right? What I would argue is that it's the creation of a class that says that truth doesn't apply to me. <laughs> You know, that, that we don't, that doesn't apply to me necessarily. And so that sort of hypocrisy comes to represent and be utilized by some people that it doesn't supply. And I, sometimes I even think that hypocrisy was built into our declaration of independence. You know, when, when we say, um, you know, all the, the, the rights of man, you know, are created equal in the very first phrase. We're not talking about man, you know, we're, we're certainly not talking about women. We're not talking about colored peoples. We're talking about moneyed, you know, white settlers in the United States. So that hypocrisy is sort of embedded in our own constitution. 
But how um, another question I have been tasked with is how is truth really a representation of how media has changed in the modern era? Most people have heard of uh, McLuhan's idea of the global village in the 1960s. He was saying, wow, this is going to be incredible. We can all have this extended global village where we have coexistence and we can all talk to each other. And he was sort of a little bit optimistic about it. But what I would argue is actually the global village uh, turns out to be more like a medieval village where it, it's full of rumor mongers and provocateurs and myth, misanthropes, uh, people who have negative evaluations of humanity, but there are also optimists and wise people and townspeople. That's what Facebook is to me, is kind of a medieval village with all the problems we had back then still, you know, and and all the rhetoric that we need to be careful of and evaluate uh, to this day. On the plus side, though, that global village is spectacular because it brings diverse perspectives into a world of discussion. I, I'm researching right now early Hollywood, which so I'm so grateful was actually founded uh, by women, Jews and immigrants. And women were the screenwriters of early Hollywood, thank God, because they brought in some very compassionate messages into the early, the framework of these early films. Early film could have gone the other way in Hollywood. It could have been like Birth of a Nation, where it was just reiterating racial stereotypes of society. Um, and part of Hollywood was very much like that. But thank God, Hollywood was full of diversity. A lot of uh, French um, attitudes and enlightenment went into Hollywood as well and producers. And so we have that as well. Sometimes when I show my students um, how bad generalizations and the representations of others can be. I show them this movie from 1963 called Mano Kane, which was an Italian uh, film um, that is all about showing how ex extravagant sensationalism and the generalization of other people can be. I mean, it's just an outrageous film. But when you see that film, I think for students at least, you can gauge how sensationalist our media has to be in the attention economy that we have in order to grab attention. You know, everything has to be blown up, hyperbolized and sensationalized. And that's the cult of the individual actually that comes into uh, the influence of lying and deception of today as well. So uh, I think I'll leave it right there and we'll go on to the next person. All right. Thanks very much, Carlos. A uh, little little bit of a trivia here, um, since you mentioned the invention of hypocrisy, which is a nice transition to our final presenter because the Greek origins of the word hypocrite actually refer to being an actor, someone who can basically convincingly portray something that is known to be false, which is a role in the play. So that takes us to our last presenter today who's gonna talk about, among other things, documentary film, and that would be uh, Michael Fox. So Michael, if you are there, I'm assuming you are, please unmute yourself and uh, the, the virtual Zoom screen is all yours. Thank you, Darren, and good morning, everybody. And you mentioned actors, and I do want to talk about fiction films at some point, but I'm here ostensibly as the documentary expert. So let's talk about documentary films for a moment, which I think most of us might see as an oasis in this conversation. That is, there. Uh, shall we say, a, the highest form of journalism, perhaps. If news broadcasts give us 30 seconds on a subject, documentary films give us 90 minutes on a subject. And therefore, uh, it's a more in-depth, more detailed, more well-rounded perspective, presumably. Now, uh, I just want to say, when I was a kid, my dad would buy the morning newspaper and the afternoon newspaper. And I would read both those papers. And as a young person, I don't think I quite grokked that it was individuals with their own experiences, backgrounds, educations, and biases. I just thought of it as if it got in the newspaper, it was true and it had weight and it had uh, passed certain gatekeepers. So uh, it might behoove us to know that documentary filmmakers 
do not have to be experts in the subject that they are making a film about, okay? Uh, that is to say, they're not experts when they begin. There's no vetting process. There's no application process. You just make a film about whatever subject you want. Now, presumably in the course of researching your film or making your film, one would become knowledgeable, but they are, these people are not necessarily experts. This might be a good place for me to interject that I am completely pro documentary, but I have various skepticisms around that, that, that I sort of want to advance and put forward. And central to that is this notion of documentaries as stories. Okay. Uh, and I say stories as opposed to truths, because uh, there is no 360 degree range of truth that could be captured in a film. It's a portion of the truth. It's a part of the truth. So let's say I wanted to tell you uh, in my own life, though this is not true, about this altercation I witnessed at the grocery store. And, and for purposes of the times, room, let's just say it was about masks, but I'm inventing this whole thing. Now, if I told you uh, that the cat had knocked over the, the box of cornflakes and therefore I had to go to the store to get cornflakes. And then when I was in the aisle, there were 17 brands of cornflakes. This would be irrelevant to the story I want to tell you about the altercation between the customer and the cashier, yes? And you would be wondering why I am diluting the drama, why I'm taking so long to get to the point, why I'm including these things that are true. The cat did knock over the box, et cetera, et cetera. But, but they don't lead us toward the drama, the, the value, the point of the story. As I said, that's all, that's all made up. Uh, so I'm using a fake story to make a real point, which is that in documentaries, some of the driving decision-making is not what is the most important or uh, what is the truth in capital letters, but what is central to the story we're following and what is extraneous, okay? Uh, a, a filmmaker I know in the Bay Area told me a very important lesson, which is he spends a great deal of time in crafting his films to head off viewers asking the wrong questions, being distracted by perhaps trivial things, okay? Because he wants the viewer to only be thinking about what he wants them to be thinking about, to only be asking the questions that he wants them to ask. Uh, if we wanna get a little more granular, we all know that documentaries are made in the editing room. They are put together, right? And uh, we assume that documentaries don't lie. We have to have some level of trust with the film and the filmmaker, otherwise there is no point in even watching it. But there are crimes of omission, crimes a strong word, but, but what's left out? or what is withheld from us until later in the film, as opposed to given to us early on, completely changes our sympathies towards the people involved and our feelings around the issue, possibly. Let me just take a minute to talk about, shall we say, uh, biographical fiction, historical fiction. Uh, because although we value documentaries and consider them very, very important in democracy, more people watch fiction films than documentaries. Even during lockdown, even with Netflix, more people are still watching fictional films. And uh, it could be a trivial point, for those of you who saw Darkest Hour, the Winston Churchill film a couple of years ago, there's a scene involving him and a young woman on the underground, <clears throat> which seems kind of fantastical <clears throat> and, and may or may not be true. But we can sort of perhaps forgive that. Uh, but how about, let's say, grander themes or uh, made up realities, if you will. And I'm thinking about Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards from a couple of years ago, which is just entertainment. It's just a revenge movie, like so many of his movies, but it's set against the backdrop of the Third Reich, which the producers aside, I, I consider a subject not really uh, that one should mess around with and take liberties with. And my knee-jerk response to that film when I 
went to review it was that this is horrible and 14 year old boys all across America will now think yada, yada, yada. Until I remembered that I saw The Longest Day at whatever age I was when I saw The Longest Day or John Wayne winning World War II by himself. And I thought that was the way it went down, right? Until I read some history or was exposed to other points of view, which deepened, enriched and corrected my perceptions. So when I sat down to review Glorious Bastards, I had to take a step back and had to hope and think that even in our culture today, those 14 year old boys at some point would take a college course or would read a book or would see maybe even a documentary and would have a greater grounding within which to see the fiction film. So I guess the last thing I want to say and then I'll let go of the microphone is uh, we haven't talked about the internet. We haven't talked about platforms. Newspapers were the original platform, right? And there were gatekeepers to that platform. Then came the movies, then came television, cable television, and the internet. And all of these uh, advances, shall we say, were held up as both uh, avenues to get more and greater truth to the masses. And then, of course, they were all appropriated or corrupted in their own ways. Whoever mentioned CNN, I seem to have a recollection from uh, the first Gulf War of an hour on CNN being devoted to the geography of that region. I can't imagine an hour of that kind of in-depth discussion on CNN today. And the internet, of course, we, we could talk from now until tomorrow about uh, its promises, its benefits, and the absence of gatekeepers, if you will, which is perhaps what's led us to this whole topic today. So with that, I'll step back. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Michael. Thanks to all the panelists for uh, their presentations. Uh, as I said earlier, and I see some people have already done this, if you have any questions or things you would like uh, further explained, please put them in the chat section. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the questions in the chat and I'll kind of parse them out. So as we're making a transition, I'm gonna start with a, an amusing comment from Irene uh, who made this comment while Carlos was talking that says, uh, also monkeys lie to each other about food sources. Um, you know, even worse is when humans lie to monkeys. That's that's when it really gets bad. But um, if you haven't seen it, what I actually thought seriously of your of your comment is that we're talking a lot about the truth. But what we've proven is that a number of other species have a sense of fairness. We've talked about truth, and I'm curious how this links to fairness. And I, I thought of this because if you haven't seen it, there's a, there's a wonderful TED talk from um, Franz De Waal who works with chimpanzees. And he does this experiment where two chimpanzees do the same thing, but they're giving them side by side and they give one chimpanzee basically a tasteless snack and the other one gets this delicious apple. And as soon as the, they give the, the one chimpanzee, they give him a, uh, this whatever it is, it's like, I don't know, like oats. He looks at it, looks at the other monkey and he throws it back in the face of the researcher. Like, I know this is not the same thing. So it's not truth, but it's a sense that somehow something is wrong and something is, that, that there's, you know, we can talk about fairness in media and equal treatment. So I, I'm curious, I, since this kind of came up as Colors was talking, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not um, this idea of, say, the anthropology of fairness has anything that helps us kind of weave in between, say, the anthropology of truth and the anthropology of lying. Carlos, would you care to comment on that? I did. Yeah, it's it is very interesting that human beings have this. We must have an innate sense of social justice, and that really does um, influence our behavior so much. I mean, I, I ever since Friends to Wall's work has come out, I've really looked at our culture so differently. One of the Greek philosophers, actually looking at democracy in the fifth century, talked about two other uh, personal freedoms that that uh, involve truth, isegoria, which is the freedom of expression for all of us. So everybody is able to freely express their thoughts. And, you know, ironically, we're, we've come very close to that. But he, when he thought of democracy too, he also thought of isonomia, and he thought that was the highest of truth, I think. Um, and and the, the highest uh, state of fairness in isonomia was the fair representation of everybody. And I think that's something 
that we're still working on. And it's a work in progress. And Black Lives Matter, for instance, is an example of that, that we, we still haven't quite gotten fair treatment for everybody. And we still, this is still a pinnacle that uh, we have to get to still. Okay. Thanks so much, Carlos. Uh, I don't know if Deirdre stepped away or whether her, her screen has changed, or if she's, you are there. So Deirdre, just, just a quick follow up, same kind of question for you in terms of journalism. Um, you know, you talked about truth in journalism. How would that be different than talking about fairness in journalism? In terms of, do we want a balanced story? We won't spin on the left and the right, or should we be approaching something that's closer to the original story itself? Does that make sense? Well, you can't, okay. Um, Fairness in journalism is a very important value. And certainly it's one of the things that's so important today and the real emphasis definitely coming out of the social justice movements, the racial reckoning, the whole uh, Black Lives Matter movement, which has led to, you know, kind of a crisis of conscience throughout society. And <clears throat> the realization that you've got to have newsrooms that are more balanced, more fair, and that represent more of the communities that you're that you're broadcasting to uh, or speaking to. So um, there's that, you know, the, if you don't have uh, representation in newsrooms um, of, you know, of the, all the different communities, races, ethnic groups, genders, everything, you don't have that, um, it's gonna be harder to collect the news from those communities and to let them have a voice and let them feel interested in what the, in the, in the storytelling that's coming out. So that's at least one point along the lines of what you're bringing up, Darren. There's you know, obviously many more things that could be said about it. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. appreciate it. i uh, got another question here, two questions actually from the same person. I'm gonna put it together. Starts out by saying, most thought Newton's physics was truth and along comes Einstein. And it turns out Newton's physics was falsity. Uh, that's actually not exactly the way they played out. It was more along the lines that Newton's physics couldn't explain everything. And so Einstein showed exactly where it broke down. But your other questions here, you have, uh, why do we think we know the truth any better than the bad guys? And we also have that meaningful discussion of truth must begin with that defining what is true or truth because those differ from person to person, family to family, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna kind of put this one over first to Sandra since she gave us a, a very personal perspective about um, you know, this, you know, one of the questions I, I actually had, had asked Sandra in a previous discussion was, you know, what's the link between our personal truth and kind of this larger socialized truth we all live in? So um, are, we, are we kind of chasing, um, you know, chasing a, a fussy squirrel trying to find the truth? Is it just very subjective or do you think we can find some way to have a shared truth that gets us closer to justice? Yeah, thanks, Darren. And that's a great question. And I, I appreciate your sort of redirecting on the Newton question, because I think that's one of the powers of scientific um, reasoning, right? Is that it gives us, you know, science never says that it's like, this is the absolute truth. It's a process that we go through in determining what, as you know, as our truth and our understanding of knowledge evolves. Um, and, and even saying that, you know, we need to recognize that at any given moment, there's some subjectivity to it. And that's really what, what I was trying to share in my comments. Um, I think, you know, as I, as I think about that relationship to evolving truth, I, I really wanna appreciate what Deirdre shared, which it's not so much that we quote unquote discover truth, that we are always in a process of seeking. Um, and there are different ways in which we can process that seeking, right? So the scientific truth is one method of seeking. Um, and there are other ways in which we find meaning um, in terms of what that particular quote unquote truth journey is. But I wanna lift up something else that was really interesting to me in the chat when someone was saying like, we quote Yoda and Dr. Spock, <laughs> not Dr. Spock, Mr. Spock, the way we used to quote Plato and something about the power of myth. And it seems to me like one of the things that we're hungry for is a meta narrative that helps us understand the context that we are in. And I don't know to what extent, you know, it's to some extent maybe popular culture is playing that role for better or worse. 
Uh, and I also think about, I was just reading something recently, I'd love to hear Deirdre's thoughts on this, about how journalism, that the demise of local journalism has meant that we now don't have uh, a local context to how we think about politics and social life. So everything gets kind of nationalized. And when it's nationalized, it, it sort of builds out this larger ideological narrative that people fight about, right? Because, it, but the, it's actually, the, the stakes are a little bit different, right? Because it's more of an ideological conversation rather than, you know, the nuts and bolts of what's happening in your local community. So, you know, just tying that back in, I just wonder, is there a role for these meta narratives? Because it does seem like it's a human desire to put our lives into some broader context. And what would that look like? Um, and how might that help us in this moment? Uh, dear Drew, would you like to respond since uh, there were a few things in there for you? Would you like to respond to any of that? Or yes. add to it? You know, it's interesting. I had I discussed that very question, Sandra, with Dean Baquet, who's the mm -hmm. editor in chief of the New York Times. And um, when he visited us at the, at the journalism school. And indeed, um, you know, one of the vexing questions that the journalist establishment was asking itself after the election of Donald Trump was, oh, how did we miss this? You know, why was it that the entire, you know, media, national media um, thought that uh, Hillary Clinton would definitely be elected and that there was no, no question um, and uh, was taken by surprise. So um, one, of the, one of the answers to that does have to do with the demise of local media. So there was an ecosystem in which the reporters who worked for the national media, the coastal elite, you know, right, um, would would keep tabs on what was going on in um, you know in, in small town America by reading those papers and by knowing the journalists in those towns. And when they went to town, they would talk to people who other journalists who were deeply embedded and really knew the community well. With that evaporating, uh, the kind of coastal media, coastal journalists took to, you know, kind of quickly parachuting into those places and relying on polls. And one of the things that was learned out of Trump's election uh, in 2016 was how badly misinformed the national media really was about the degree of dissatisfaction among um, rural Americans, small town Americans, um, you know, th throughout the country with the way things were going and how unhappy they were with the Democrats um, and how extremely unhappy they were with Hillary Clinton. So, you know, that was, um, that it was huge learning experience for journalism and it's, it's been trying to, you know, learn some lessons from it and has to a degree but it was caused by what you were pointing to, Sandra, the, the, the demise of trusted local sources um, and, the, and the end of a sort of a feeder system that allowed the um, more national media to get information from, you know, coming up from the grassroots. So that's, that's kind of irreplaceable in many ways. Um, it, what's taken its place is is social media and often social media misinformation and disinformation. And you know, these kind of si silos of, of information. That's not good. Thank you for that. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on to another thing here. First, I wanna, I wanna just throw this out there since uh, Sandra had mentioned meta narratives. I think it's interesting. We have a, a whole very influential school of thought called postmodernism which has basically cultivated the belief that we should mistrust all meta narratives that meta narratives are basically nothing other than really rhetorical power grabs so you know we're kind of torn in between we we want to have that larger truth but then someone says the more we reach for a larger truth the more we get into the distortion of power um so there's a question here that says you know it's quite simple it says documentaries are manipulated and have their own fictions no and I know Michael talked about this, but I just want to add another example, which is um, there was a, a pop song that came out a few years ago by uh, Megan Trainer called All About That Bass, in which she basically was, it was kind of an anti-Photoshop song, like stop Photoshopping and let's all accept the fact that different body shapes are equally attractive and things like this. And, and I kind of wrote an article about this, but, but my point was, you know, the irony is, is that the way a pop song is made is that it is 
audio photoshopped down to the microsecond by sound engineers and recording engineers and you you know so it's we want really highly polished music and we're we want that in a song that says stop polishing things and so michael i'm gonna i'm gonna feel this over to you about the i know you address this a little bit but about this idea of of you know is, is there such a thing as a non-manipulative film medium whether it's fiction film or whether it's documentaries uh, and for the rest of you, this idea of of is is the lack of photoshopping or the lack of that kind of you know editing. Deirdre, you were an editor. What are you doing? You're trying to improve things by well, kind of photoshopping them too. So is that is that really a manipulation and a distortion that takes us away from the truth, or is it something else? So Michael, I'll start with you, and then I'll let anyone else jump in who wants to afterward. Michael, unmute yourself. Sorry, Michael, got to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Well, I don't think that there's a film equivalent right now to punk rock. You know, lo-fi, uh, first take, put it out there. Because the whole world expects a certain level of production values. But, there, but if we talk about um, uh, a spectrum in which the filmmaker wants you to buy hook, line, and sinker what he's advancing versus the film that just that wants to provoke you, that wants to make you just question things, for example, okay? To leave you in a different spot than being persuaded of something else at the end, then certainly that, that exists in narrative filmmaking and documentary filmmaking. I mean, I suppose we could throw Michael Moore into this conversation because that's a point of reference that everybody knows and Michael Moore wants you to believe what he believes and think what he thinks, but I think he also knows that he's pushing your buttons wherever you are in the spectrum. Uh, and I can't bring up Michael Moore without bringing up the word propaganda, because that's how people define highly biased or pieces or pieces in which the point of view is so obvious and transparent. And, and there can be value to that because it provokes you and forces you to bounce off of that. Uh, so I'm a little bit away from your, your question, Darren, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I guess I would also say that each of us brings our own thing to every movie. And, and we interpret the movie and react to the movie in our own way, whatever the filmmaker's goals are. Uh, we talked about fairness. There, there, there are legions of documentary filmmakers who are astounded, uh, have been astounded when audiences hated the subject of their film, for example, who thought that the film was was a hit piece on them. And the filmmakers were not coming from that place at all. So it's, so it's how the viewers perceived the subject of the film and the film. All right, thanks, Michael. I'm gonna go turn this qu same question over to the other panelists in case I'm gonna add something to it. So I'll just go in order. Uh, this, so the question is really about this kind of, the, the general idea of Photoshopping things in our profession to make them look perhaps different, is that somehow an act of deception and untruth or where does that fit in? So I'll go with you first, Andrew, would you like to say anything on this? Gosh, <laughs> I think about as I Photoshop my headshots. <laughs> <laughs> is that the deception? Um, you know, yes, I do. I mean, you know, depending on the context again, right? Like I think if we're talking about the reporting of an event or news, then yes, it is a deception. For the most part, I mean, you know, and then there are things that you do. I, I mean, if you guys will remember back uh, during the O.J. Simpson trial, there was this big controversy. I think it was Newsweek that darkened his picture on their cover, right? And to to sort of play into this narrative of you know him being the um, you know a frightening black man. So things like that obviously are are intentional and have political and social consequences. Um, but, you know, I could imagine there may be other instances where it's not, right? So I think it's partly contextual and partly what the intent is. Thanks for that. Uh, Deirdre, I see you smiling because I know you probably have a lot to say on this. You know, should, should there be punk rock journalism with no editing or is editing something that we desperately need? Any thoughts well, on that? Okay. Well, uh, I, I think that th there is such a thing as fact-checking in legitimate journalism. 
And um, when we talk about seeking truth, I mean, there, there are facts and I would defend against the postmodernist uh, idea that, there's, that, that everything is manipulation. Um, but journalism can do a good job on um, finding, you know, getting to the truth of things with the, the you know, the, the classic who, what, where, and why. So these things can be determined, who, what, where, and, and who, what, where, and when, excuse me, who, what, where, and when. Those things are things you can fact check. It's the why that is the pesky one. So as soon as you begin to get into the, 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 the why, it's all interpretation. And the journalist <laughs> goes out and talks to people who have different interpretations. The journalist, you know, uh, himself or herself comes up with you know opinions about who to believe, who to trust, which which perspective among all of them is the one to really feature. The editor comes in and adds further manipulation. Yes, as soon as you have interpretation, it's it's it becomes it becomes a matter of who you trust. And um, so, you know, uh, the the liberal. Uh, elite me journalism, to use those phrases, um, trusts scientists, trusts the CDC to bring it back to this whole vaccine issue and continues to beat that drum. Um, and, but uh, outside of that world, trust becomes just who you trust. And it might be your grandmother. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to go to Carlos next, since you mentioned, you know, the anthropology of lying, you know, with this whole photo, if a Photoshop is a lie, you know, in, in a weird way, we're talking about who owns the truth, but do people prefer lies sometimes? And, and you know, is that kind of our human nature where we, we actually aren't truth seeking, we're just some, seeking something else? Any thoughts on that, Carlos? Wow, I don't know. That's a big story. Do people prefer lies? I would say, you know, ironically, it's part of the American character to like to like romantic endings. You know, world cinema is a lot more pessimistic than we are in America. If it's not a, a Hollywood, I mean, Casablanca is the, you know, the high point of American cinema, you know, where people become friends and, and fly off. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about that postmodernism that you brought up, Darren. You know, postmodernism was a m movement in the 70s into the 90s where we were questioning questions, you know, questioning the questioner. And there was this point I felt like <clears throat> reading all that, that literature that, um, that was about questioning perspectives that became a little nihilistic. I felt like I would read these articles and postmodernist classic articles, and there was an argument, a line of argument going on, but there was never any conclusion because the authors didn't dare make a conclusion because it was from their perspective. So it was sort of circular and nihilistic. And I'm like, thank God we won't have that moment again, <laughs> you know, but here, here we are, you know, we're in a postmodern movement. And I think the first great postmodernist film actually was Rashomon, you know, by Akira Kurosawa that tells the tale of a murder and rape in four different perspectives. You know, you get that idea. Even the murder, the murder victim has a story <laughs> in Rashomon. Maybe every juror should be able to have to see Rashomon before they go into a jury trial to realize that, look, eyewitness testimony is really unreliable and stuff like that. Um, but uh, so I'll, I think I'll stop there. All right. Well, thanks for that. And I can wrap that discussion up with uh, this quote from Linda from, from JFK that says, too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought, which I'm not sure I would say is a preference for lies, but it is kind of interesting how sometimes the truth makes us think too much and we're a little more comforted by happy endings like Casablanca than we are with complex films like Rashomon. Um, so we got a couple of questions here about, you know, because we've all mentioned trust, maybe a crisis of trust. And it raises the question of, you know, how we can build that trust. And, you know, I guess it's, it's uh, I'm thinking anthropologically all of a sudden. Uh, you, you, many of you may have read um, a famous anthropologist called Margaret Mead. Uh, and Margaret Mead is kind of interestingly a, a bit like a, a victim of postmodernism because people read into her anything they want to read. Um, and the reason I thought about it is because as I, I've done a lot of work in the Pacific Islands and there, there's one prevailing theory that Margaret Mead's work is basically 
not true. It's, it's flawed because she didn't understand the cultural environment she was working in. And what that means is that she had all of these Pacific Islander informants, but in Pacific Islander culture, they knew they had found information that she didn't want to hear. And so they basically told her what she wanted to hear and not what she'd actually see. And, you know, it, it creates this whole fascinating kind of meta layer of where do we situate trust in that whole context? So since trust has come up so much in relation to everyone's comments, quite frankly, you know, whether we trust the documentary film or, or you know, how we build trust, I'm curious to, I'm gonna go back through the panelists uh, starting again with, with Sandra. Um, you know, if we have a crisis of trust, can you think of an example of something or do you have a recommendation for where we could start to rebuild trust, which is probably the first step towards finding truth? Sandra, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, and you don't always have to start with me first if you didn't want to, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> but these are such hard questions. But, um, you know, I'll again, I'll just reflect on my own experiences, which is that, um, you know, it's oftentimes when we, when we approach these questions, we think of them in, in that broadest sense, like, you know, there's distrust and how do we build trust? And, and, and I think sometimes we may make it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, one of the things that I've found, so just as a bit of context, I've done a lot of work in various communities. I've worked in Sub-Saharan Africa for a number of years. Um, I've done a lot of canvassing and political work. Um, in 2012, I walked precincts in, in battleground states because I wanted to meet people unlike myself. <laughs> um, and you know what's fascinating about that is that there's a lot of distrust on the front end. But what I learned is that just the process of actually listening to people, <laughs> You know, it's, it's amazing how much trust can be built in even little tiny moments. And there's actually some, some research, I think it's some folks on Berkeley that have done this research on something called deep canvassing. Um, and deep canvassing is around people who are going out and engaging with potential voters about really contentious issues. Um, but instead of coming out and, um, you know, basically, you know, this is my position and this is why you should you know, vote as I, would like you to just asking them you know what do you think actually listening maybe offering some stories from your own experience as to why they might want to think about it differently and there's actually been research that shows that that can shift how people behave how people think and so in my experiences when i was doing this canvassing i found that to be true um and it's really kind of it's it's um encouraging to think that it doesn't necessarily take you know, months of dialogue that in fact, sometimes when people sense genuine interest in who they are, that that can, you know, facilitate a shift. I'll give one quick story and then I'll stop. When I was canvassing in, I wanna say Colorado, um, and they sent me off into the hills of somewhere all by myself. Uh, and I knock on this door and this young man an answers the door and he's got shaved head and he had some kind of weird, you know, I don't know, racialized thing on his t-shirt. I don't remember what it was and boots. And my, my first impression was like, ooh, this guy kind of looks like a skinhead. Um, and, you know, here I am as an Obama <laughs> canvasser, which did not go over well. Um, and he just started like, you people, you people come to my door and you people this and you people that. And I didn't know what you people meant. Like, is it you people Obama people? Is it you people black people? I didn't know, but I, I, I don't know why. I just decided to just let him go on. And, you know, sort of just engaging him. Like, what do you mean? And, and so we had this like maybe five or 10 minute conversation. And at the end of it, I said, you know what? Whatever you decide, what's important to me is that you vote and that your voice is heard. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. And so as I went to go turn around and leave, he, he literally came out the door after me and he actually looked emotional. And he said, you know what, this is the first time someone like you has ever listened to me. And you know, you just never know. I mean, that's a little tiny seed. You never know what that meant in the longer scheme of things. But moments like that really give me encouragement that it may not be as insurmountable as we often think. All right, thanks for that, 
Andrew, I also want to apologize. The funny thing was, since I mentioned fairness, I thought I was just being fair by going back through the same order we presented. And then I realized, yes, I'm putting you on the spot all the time. I'm just teasing so see, you. I, You're good. <laughs> I thought it was being fair. Uh, let me go uh, see if uh, Deirdre, Michael, or Carlos have any, any thoughts on the idea of, of how to build trust. I could just, I'll start with Deirdre, I guess. And any thoughts on that? Or you want to, you, you can pass. It's okay. But if any thoughts? Yeah, um, boy, I do <laughs> agree with Sandra and, and other people in the chat who are talking about touching the heart and, you know, there's, yeah, there's been a lot of research about these kind of one-to-one -one communications, canvassing. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the importance of going to people um, and asking them what they're interested in, asking them what they want from politicians rather than going there to say, I came here to, in order to try to convince you to vote for a Democrat or a Republican, right? But starting with, with them, it's it's hard for journalists to be doing that. That's really not their role. So uh, I do think that um, all we can do is continue to you know seek the truth um, and and tell and tell the truth as best as we can as we can, and constantly be scrutinizing ourselves as journalists about you know our own powers of interpretation what we rely on and how we're how we're um you know how how fair and honest we think we are and you know mindful that um that we can always be wrong and being 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 self-correcting as much as possible i think those are the the things the ethics that guide journalists best thanks for the insight deirdre um i just want to point out uh, paul has said that we've all photoshopped our backgrounds to show our version of the truth. I just want to say, I didn't Photoshop my background. In my neighborhood, it's evening. So that's the truth behind me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carlos, any, any thoughts on this? Or uh... These are real books. <laughs> Some of them, which I actually have read. Um, I feel like uh, it, if, if it's not complex and contextual, you know, it's not the truth. I mean, we, we have to get used to the idea that truth is complicated uh, on one level. Uh, I, I also think that we need to like re-simplify sometimes the message of truth. I, I'm going to call this the new diet phenomena of truth, which is we, we lack trust because we always hear about so many diets, for instance. And so I went to my trainer at the gym and I said, I start talking about diets with her and I'm like, I, I, how about this diet that, what do you think will work? And she said, uh, Carlos, um, calories in calories out. Let's go to work. <laughs> and so like her message was like, you just don't need to eat as much food. I mean, the, the thing about diets is that they're all kind of saying the same thing. We eat too much animal fat. We eat too much you know, and we should go back to a more wholesome, like sort of paleo diet where we're not eating all these complex things we've come up with in the last few hundred years. So there's an essential truth about all of these diets. And I think we need to, you know, follow the example. I, I said this to the uh, uh, to the group the other day, Greta Thunberg, you know, who resimplifies the truth. She's, you know, uh, she has, she does these great programs where she talks to scientists. She's very open-minded, but in the end, she still says, I'm still finding the same thing. You're killing my planet. Please give me a future, <laughs> you know, or like Bernie Sanders for a while there, Bernie, remember him? He was like, Bernie, can you say something different? You know, class politics, class politics. But, you know, he really reinforced that. And I, you know, that's still a problem we haven't even addressed, you know, classism and the new classism. Um, so I think just to, to gather truth again and trust, we, we just need to keep reinforcing the truth that, you know, we all can, we all know. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Michael, any, any thoughts on rebuilding trust? Uh, well, I think of uh, maybe how we looked at the MTV generation, which is already 40 years ago, that young people were so steeped, so saturated in visual material that we presumed that they were very sophisticated about it and couldn't be fooled, shall we say. And uh, 
I think we can say that's not true of, of, of them or younger people. So I guess what I would fall back on, and I think this is gonna be a, a theme that most people in this community, in this room would subscribe to, which is education which might be media literacy, but not exclusively media literacy, uh, which of course involves critical thinking. But um, again, in the schools teaching young people how media is produced and how the message works and being able to, I don't, can I put the word deconstruction into this conversation somewhere? Uh, uh, with the hope that we're all savvier, smarter, more proactive consumers of media. And thanks. On that note, uh, mindful of the fact that we are in our last 10 minutes here, I'm going to do one more sweep and I'm going to try to combine a lot of things here together. Uh, reference has been made to touching the heart, which brings me to the phrase of hearts and minds. And what I love about this is we all know what that means. You know, we have to win hearts and minds, but we don't win them in the same way. In many ways, you win hearts with emotion which I don't want to say emotion is deception because that takes me closer to postmodernism, but, you know, emotion is about, you know, having the photoshopped image or the, the touching scene at the end of the movie, things that we, we might even know are not real, or we know, you know, a rose is basically just a flower. And yet, you know, on February 14th, someone gives you a rose. And, you know, if you say things like, you know, any flower will do, it's like, no, it's, it's the rose. Um, and then minds, of course, is all about the truth. So we have on the one hand, this idea that somehow truth is never quite, and that was the thing about Spock, right? Spock was always about the truth. He didn't have emotion. So we need that as well. So the, 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 I'm gonna wrap this together and say, on the one hand, it seems like we always need this kind of truth and honesty, but there's another aspect to it that actually cries out for manipulation. The real trick here, and this follows in your point, Michael, is, and, and by the way, my comments today were supposed to be about politicians and why they lie. And I figured I just went in a different direction with the Supreme Court thing, because I figured you all know the politicians lie. But um, my whole point in doing the Supreme Court thing was about the empowerment that we actually have. And so there's the hearts and minds aspect, but there's also the element that the deceit only works if we, consumers of information, don't do due diligence. In other words, to the extent, you know, the, the lying and the lack of truth only works to the extent that we are able to be fooled. So the last question is really about the hearts and minds part, and also the part about, you know, what would you say in terms of our ability to be able to see through the lies in terms of how can we do a better job at that? And I'm not going to talk start with Sandra this time because <laughs> I'm going to be fair and reverse. I'm going to start with Michael. Uh, we've got about seven minutes left, so if you have any thoughts on basically, since you, you know, was your comment, Michael, that said, you know, we need to consume information better, how do, how do we, how can we watch documentaries in a better way, more empowered way? Well, thanks so much, Darren, for starting with me. Um, I guess I'm stuck in this notion also that we have our own belief systems, and, and, uh, and we filter information, even documentaries, through what we believe in to our values and it's hard to be persuaded to see something or accept something that's outside of that. That's, that's a challenge. Uh, and emotion certainly is part of it. But, I, but again, I feel that if uh, you're aware of how you're being, to use the cheap word manipulated, then at least you have some agency with respect to the material. Interesting point. There's, there's quite a few comments uh, from, from uh, in, in the chat about this idea, yeah, exactly, that we prefer to believe the myth, but I like the idea that we have, if we're aware that we're believing the myth, that's different than actually believing the myth, so like that. Let me go back in backwards order. Carlos, any thoughts on either hearts and minds or, you know, what our role is in all of this as consumers of information? Well, I think uh, creating, uh, changing attitudes is about creating empathy, ultimately. You know, Cicero, the great rhetorician, um, he, he knew that he could use facts um, in his speeches, but he, but he didn't. He usually used pathos and ethos. He usually went to the emotions and he went to the ethical argument because he knew that's how you could really change the jury. And um, 
but what I, what, and I think how, how we do that, how, how we can improve that is like to give a COVID uh, example, how can, how can we get people to do more immunization? You know, I was thinking about this, what we see a lot of on mainstream media right now on CNN is a lot of values shaming, you know, like, why aren't you doing this? And that's like really not effective because it doesn't bring any empathy, empathy, but what would bring empathy and what when when I see it re, when I see mainstream media really being effective is talking to doctors' testimony in the hospital about how they are having to do this and survivors' testimony of what they had to go through. I mean, I wish they would ask me what I went through with COVID. It was horrible. I had pneumonia. I, I felt like I was going to die. Why? You know, this is this is much more effective to to really uh, look at bridging empathy in individuals. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Deirdre, I'll go to you and I'll, I'll say we've got like four minutes left. So if you could kind of take maybe just a minute or so, if you have any thoughts on this, go right ahead. Well, uh, okay, well, uh, you know, our role is to just to try to be wise consumers of information. Uh, Linda Wing, I think in the chat said, you know, we need to build trust in ourselves. And doing what you did, Darren, going to the source, you know, going, going to the Supreme Court decision, um, looking for supporting evidence, and, um, and trying to be wise, uh, be wise uh, and canny and skeptical consumers of information, um, and making good decisions about who to trust. All right, thank you for that, Deirdre. And last, uh, last and most fair. <laughs> Thank you. Andra. Well, you know, I don't, I don't tend to think of hearts and minds as being opposites. I think there's something that's connected there. And I think, you know, I spend most of my time with student activists here at Cal and they are, and most activists are driven by emotions. Um, and what we know about persuasion, and I think Carlos spoke to this a bit, is that, you know, you're only going to get so far with facts. That, that in fact, you know, how people are moved differently is something, you know, that speaks to them at a different level. Um, that said, one of the things I always try to share with our students is that, yes, acknowledge the emotions, acknowledge the, the subjectivity of what you're feeling um, and your beliefs and values, but you have choices about that, right? Like, don't be driven and led by that purely, but how do you then take that um, and you know, run that against what it is that you're trying to realize in the world. Because what I do see one challenge here at Cal sometimes is that our students can get really um, uh, entrenched in their emotional space and think that is their, their core truth. And it is a part of their truth, right? It's not the whole story. All right, thank you for that, Sandra. So. Uh, I now I'm going to have to bring things to a close. Uh, very quickly, someone has asked, how do we get the PDF from the Supreme Court? I mentioned, it's easy. You go to the Supreme Court website and uh, you can download any case there. And if you can't find it, send me an email. I'm happy to help you with that. Uh, let me close by saying, uh, so, so last year uh, I was invited to give a TED talk and it turns out it was you know an online TED talk, which too bad. But what I chose as my topic was the politics of laughter. And I kind of took aim at Plato. And I thought of this because someone said, we don't quote, quote Plato anymore. And I quoted Plato because I said, Plato got it wrong. Plato built his utopian society by having these philosopher kings rule. But what was interesting is he said the philosopher kings were forbidden from one thing, which was laughing. He said, basically, jokes and humor were what lower peoples did because they're deceitful. And I kind of said, you can't really have a, an ideal society without laughter. In fact, utopia with, you know, with any place without laughter is, is not a utopia. I mean, philosopher kings not laughing, they're not a lot of fun. That's why I never invite philosopher kings to any of my parties. It's like, I want fun people at my parties, right? So on that note, you know, kind of reflect on that. You know, jokes, we know they're not real, but we love them anyway. Documentary films, fictional films, journalism, good stories, they all have have a role to play. And, and I want to thank you know, my fellow panelists for helping us kind of negotiate a better path in all the information we consume. So Sandra, Deirdre, Carlos, Michael, uh, great thanks to all of you for your insights and, and your presentations today. And uh, to all the people here, all the Ali folks, it's so great to see you here. And uh, if you know, keep the conversation going, always send me an email if you want to. I'm happy to keep the conversation going. 
And uh, I'll have to say farewell for now because we're at 1130. Everybody take good care uh, and uh, laugh a little today. Show Plato he was wrong. All right. <laughs>